Welcome to another episode of The Crown Between Two Roses. I am Duchess Eva von Danzig here joined with Duchess Englund and we are so privileged today to be joined by Viscountess Rowan Peregrine today. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, hopefully we won't uh, bombard you with too many questions. Um, I'd just like to, to start off with our acknowledgement. So good nobles, we come here together in a spirit of fellowship, deepening of our skills, sharing of our knowledge and a shared interest in the search to find the truth through experimental archeology span and historical inquiry. It is in this context that I, Engelin, on behalf of my kingdom, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we gather. We recognize their continuing connection to land and culture, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and the elders of other communities who may be here today. So awesome, thank you for, for joining us, Rowan. This is very exciting. I, um, I tuned into your interview with uh, Rithkin and uh, was it Mari as well, mm -hmm. and learned so much about the history of Lockhart and um, all the bits and pieces on the way. But here, I want to hear about you. So can you start us off by telling us a, a bit about your, your first personal um, journey to meeting the SCA? <laughs> I had... Uh, a really, really unusual journey. I, as I've said to other people, the weird thing for me is that I was never a newcomer. So I actually started a medieval group before the SCA, before we joined up with the SCA. And the, the background to that is that I had always heard, I, I'd always loved uh, the Middle Ages. I had always loved the music and the art and everything. And I'd also been playing war games for several years. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be fun to actually do this for real? You know, we could actually have a, a 10 foot corridor and we could, we could make weapons and we could do all of these things. So LARP, I guess. Um, and somebody told me that there was a group that uh, did that, but they were in the States. And I thought, ah, oh, well, you know, if only, I, if only. And then um, I went to the States with my, I, I traveled to the States and was over there and somebody invited me with, I, I went with my then husband. I got married at 18, I don't advise it. Um, and we went over and we stayed there for three months in Florida and somebody invited us to go to what turned out to be a Crown Tawny. I, we were not getting on well, I did not go, he went. He came back and he told me all about it and I so wished that I had gone. So I pestered him for every detail all the way back home. And after stewing on this for a few weeks, I thought, okay, damn it, I, I, I really, really want this. And we can't, we don't have any way of connecting with the group there. So I'll start something similar here. And I talked to the people in the wargaming group and they were keen. So basically I started to do research into everything, heraldry. There happened to be a medieval dance uh, class going on in uh, that semester. So I went along to that. And somebody in the wargaming group said, hey, somebody tried to start this group here a few years ago and it, it didn't take off, but I think I've still got the paperwork. So they went and they came back with a, a small booklet which had some information in it. And I thought, great, we, we can make this happen. Um, what I didn't realize was that this had been written in AS4. And in AS4, how you started a group was that you got a bunch of people together and you called yourself a kingdom. And there were two kingdoms, there was the East and the West. So I thought, we can do that. And so we got a group of people together and we called ourselves the Kingdom of Utremir over the seas. And um, according to this little booklet, you, the way that you did it was you got a bunch of people together and you had a tournament and whoever was the winner, they were king. So I had been making armor because I could do leather work and I attached metal strips to it. And, I, but I wasn't, I wasn't a metal worker. So they were using bike helmets, motorbike helmets and sticks. We hadn't discovered rattan yet either. And there was this discussion about, well, I need to run the group, so you need to be king, so you better win the fight. It was just like, we knew nothing about what we were doing. 
but we did that and we had uh, a, a real event and we um, are still in motorbike helmets and, and the rest of it. And we've got pictures of that. We had our first event and it was with the Lane Cove. Um, we're, we're having a medieval day. So we all went along and we, we were more or less dressed up and we had uh, some fighters. And uh, yes, it was, it was really quite astonishing. Meanwhile, I had been writing to the addresses in the book saying, um, we, we'd like to join, we, you know, talk, talk to us. Again, not realizing that it was 13 years old, this particular little thing. So I didn't hear anything back, but we got more and more people interested. We had some more events. We had a picnic in the park and we had, um, we, we were doing a lot of dancing by this stage. And then the critical thing really happened in, so just in terms of timing, we had our first event in October, 1980. We were all students. And I put out the first edition of Runes, the newsletter, in about the beginning of 1981. And about the middle of 1981, one of our number went to America and went to Worldcon and came back with the Known World Handbook. And suddenly here it all was in all its glory. And it was just the most amazing thing ever. Um, everything you'd ever wanted to know about everything. So brilliant. And I felt so inspired by all the stuff that was in there, but also so a little small because of what I'd tried to create was so tiny and weak compared to this gloriousness. But it was fabulous. And suddenly I had um, more up-to-date numbers and contact details and so on. So I wrote lots more letters off to people to try and say, hey, talk to us. But based on that, we realized that in fact, we weren't a kingdom, we were a barony. And I should say that by this stage, uh, my husband X had departed, he'd gone back to America. So we realized that we were a barony, that's what we were. So we called ourselves the barony of Utremere. That was a nice, easy change. And we had a tournament to determine the first baron, who I think was, uh, his name will come to me, James the Sinister. He was the first baron. And we had more events. Based on this, we now had patterns for making helmets. And so Brucey of the Orkneys made two helmets out of 12 gauge, I think. They were incredibly heavy barrel helms, but hey, they were helmets. They were amazing. Um, and we had more events and we had more people. We set ourselves up a full, based on the handbook, we had a full slate of officers. We had um, monthly council meetings. We did everything. But we still hadn't heard back from the SCA. So we were calling ourselves the Society for the Current Middle Ages. We didn't want to appropriate the name without actually being to, able to contact the SCA. And eventually we decided that I'd written, I think, more than 20 letters by that point. I was very determined and we still hadn't heard anything back. So eventually I thought, right, what we need to do is we need to pool our student dollars and we need to ring the USA. And this is in the days before the internet and an international phone call was so expensive. So we figured out the times um, and we all gathered, it was in one of the council meetings and we rang the steward of the society and they were there. And we said, you know, we, we're calling, we realize this is a call out of the blue. We're calling from Australia. We'll be really interested in trying to join up with, with the SCA. And the steward said, well, yes, we, 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 I'm not gonna do the fake American accent. We, we'd heard that there was a, a group in, in Australia and gosh, you must have, you know, like a dozen people by now. And I said, we have 70. Wow. And there was like dead silence on the other end of the phone. And by the end of that phone call, we had become a March barony directly under the steward, but not attached to any kingdom. We just existed in this, <laughs> this little pocket. But we started then having regular conversations and, and we then had regular mail correspondence and 
gradually sorted out of the details. And in the first case, we we had wanted to become part of, we wanted, we thought we wanted to join Qaeda because we thought that that's where things had started. And we sent a petition to them and they wrote back saying, well, there are a number of problems here. One is that you can't have the whole of Australia as a barony. Um, you, can only have a, you can only have a little local group. Um, and there were, there were several other things that, that turned out to be uh, a problem. So in the end, three of us decided that we would travel to the USA and we would go and have a look at things. And this was discussed over time with the steward that we would go kingdom shopping. And uh, so that's then what we did. But at the time that we went to the States, which is like a whole nother story and would take forever. So I won't tell you about that one. Um, at the point that we were there, that was the first event that I hadn't run. That was the first time I'd seen people in garb that I hadn't made. That was the first time I'd seen real fighters with, with real armour and um, it was the most astonishing thing. That's yeah. amazing. May I ask as well, how old were you at the time that all this was going on? Um, when we started this, I was 20. That's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty incredible. <laughs> so I, so I just, uh, that's the other thing, of course, that uh, is that I just became Baroness. Like, you know, there wasn't an investiture or anything. It just happened. Yeah. Uh, so I never stepped up. That's a, it's, it's <laughs> so, but it sounds like you deserved it. You were driving, <laughs> relentlessly driving this project. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, the Barony of Rowany is named after you, if I'm not mistaken. So how did that come about? Once we'd properly connected up, we realised that, well, we were told we couldn't have Utremere. Um, Utremere, we, we needed to find a new name. And already we started to have people who were over in uh, Perth. Some of the people from Sydney had moved to Perth. So there was a group starting in Perth and Yalashir. Um, so we realized that we needed two names really. We needed a name for the local group and we needed a name for the area because we could see that, that we were going to need a, a, a regional name as well. So at our first camping event, which I think was in June 1982-ish, yeah, yeah. We had a, um, uh, a competition. So people put forward names for the local area and people put forward names for the, for the bigger, um, bigger group. So my favourite for the local era was actually Malatur, um, but there were there was Rowany and Rowanfeld and a whole bunch of other variations on that, and that's the one that that got up um, and Lockhart for the for the greater area. So we we already had uh, Lockhart being the, the name for the region. But how did you choose <laughs> your name? That's a good question. Um, I liked the name Rowan. Um, I'd always liked the name Rowan. And Peregrine, I heard, I read somebody else who had the name and I thought, oh, I like that name. And I like the idea of the, the Peregrine Falcon. And at that point I wasn't doing German. And by the time I was, which was about a year later, it was too late. I, I had the name, that was it. I wasn't gonna be changing my name. I'm, I'm fascinated around like how similar the group that started before you um, brought on all the SCA type kind of conventions, how similar did it run to what you learned the SCA to be? So you say that when you went to the, the States, you went to an event that you didn't run for the first time, but had the things that you had been running kind of parallel to that or were they entirely different how you approached the, the running of things? They were really similar, in part because we had, uh, because the Known World Handbook really was like a primer for everything. It talked about how to have uh, a tournament. It talked about how to run a feast. And I also had my, uh, my own ideas about that anyway. And because I had already been heavily involved in researching how the Middle Ages worked rather than how the SCA worked, we were trying to emulate the Middle Ages. 
And that's something that came across in a few ways in the early times. Um, I, I had designed a whole lot of devices for people. And again, when we connected up and we finally had a kingdom, we sent those off to be registered. I think the first batch had maybe a dozen devices in it. But because they were ones that I designed based on uh, Fox Davies, they were very good heraldry. We got lots of compliments for the, for the good heraldry. And because I was looking at it from a medieval point of view, not, um, not copying what other people were doing, they were all, they were all clear. We got them all, all through. Um, so so that, was, that was funny. The group that I initially started, the, the current Middle Ages, was a much smaller time period. So I think we went from, I can't remember, it, it was shorter on each end. I can't remember what it was, like 1200 to 1500 or something. But then the handbook came out and its range at that time was 600 to 1600. So we expanded out to match that. That's fantastic. So I suppose at this point, you know, it's been decades upon decades of experience that you've had you know, enjoying the SCA and, and founding groups. What's one of your favorite things about the society? I think that it provides uh, an environment in which people can find their passion and can learn new skills, can discover within them the, the crafts and the skills and so on that are there. And for me, it's, it, it's kind of like an ideal situation because I am a craft person. I make all the things and I have an endless list of different hobbies. So if I hadn't been in the society, before then I had uh, a music group that I did things with and then I had a separate group that I did other things with and so on. So one of the things that's been great for me has been the fact that I can decide that my focus at the moment is dance or my focus at the moment is costume or I really want to get back into doing uh, calligraphy and illumination or whatever after having put it aside for 15 years and I can do that within this steady context I don't need to to learn a new group of friends I don't need to break into a new group I can just live within this environment and do all of these different things and I can do them all at once or I can you know do one and then decide that I've, I've done that for a while, I'll put that aside and I'll take up some new sub hobby, but it's still within the context. And uh, yeah, so that's that's been really good. And it's also how I personally have stayed interested all this time is that I have gone through a sequence of focusing on different kinds of activities. And some of those been organizational. I've held lots of different offices at lots of levels. And some of those have been creative. And so I've, I've got to do all of these different things. And if one of those starts to pull, I have plenty of other things that I can pick up. That's um, pretty cool that there's so much to do. And obviously you've been doing a lot of different things for a long period of time. What's, what's next on the, the to-do list that you haven't tried before or an office that you haven't held? Is there something that you'd, you'd love to do? Um, hmm. On a small scale, the thing that had been on my, I really, really want to have a go at this list for years and years and years and years was pewter casting. So I, I got to do that earlier this year, which was great. And I got to, uh, after getting some initial instruction from a couple of people who knew what they were doing, um, I, I then got to play around with that and I'm, I really enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to doing more of that. So that, that had been something I'd really, really wanted to do. And it had been very frustrating because I'd had several opportunities where I'd been to an event where there was a class on pewter casting and three times and every time I was teaching a class against it. So, so that, that's, a, that's a small thing, but I really enjoyed doing it. <laughs> The big thing that I'm doing at the moment, the big project that I'm doing at the moment, which is going to take me a while longer, is um, something again that I said that I, I, I really should be doing. I really should do this for decades, 
which is to actually you know, have a website and put all my stuff up. Um, and I have been meaning to do that for decades and it's never been a high enough priority. It's always been more important to work, uh, to make the thing, to run the event, to um, run the group, to, to do whatever. But I, um, after the experience of teaching online last year with Polit Uni, um, I discovered I really liked teaching online. I really enjoyed it and I want to do a lot more of that. But I want to be able to refer back to things and I don't want to have to send out endless copies of class notes. So I really need the website so that I can do the video channel. So, so that's, that's my current big project and I'm spending a couple of hours a day working on that at the moment. That's fantastic. Yeah. Such a, a real asset for people, I think. I, I was laughing before because I think it's quite funny that being a Laurel and Lockhart, we spend a lot of time asking people if they have a blog. <laughs> It, it, it is funny that uh, that you don't have one, but you are correct. People do tend to take it for granted that doing that takes time that you could be doing other things. <laughs> so I understand uh, from listening to your previous interviews, and of course you mentioned before that that first outing to the West Kingdom was the first time that you saw people who weren't wearing garb that you had assisted in making and you are a prolific teacher and an inspirational teacher so do you have any tips or tricks that you have maybe uh had a lot of experience with about teaching people different skills crafts or jobs mm, okay to give give uh, advice to other teachers I think it's really important to understand, firstly, what it is that you want to achieve. So if you're teaching a class on something, usually you've got a restricted time, an hour or, or maybe two hours if it's a long class. Think about what are the key principles, what are the learnings, what are the new skills, what are the new understandings that you want them to come away with at the end of that time? And then keep that in mind. Don't don't waste time on things that don't align with those aspects um, so that you get the most value out of the time that you've got. The second thing is to try and understand where your audience is coming from. When I'm teaching face-to-face -face, and in a normal year, I would teach 30 odd face-to-face -face classes. And so I, I do a lot of face-to-face -face teaching, one of the things I do always is to go around and to find out what, where people are at, what is their current understanding, and uh, because then I can adjust what I'm saying. If they're all um, quite a long way down the road, then we can start down the road, and I don't waste time going over things that they don't understand. But usually it's a mix of people, and you need to find a way to bring people who this is a new topic for, up to speed uh, quickly, but so that they've got, so you're not jumping into the middle. I think that's important. And I think um, a well-structured class is really important. My classes are all extremely structured. I know exactly what I want to get through. I know the sequence. I will do a lot of thinking about um, things that will contribute. So, uh, things that people can touch or feel or examples of things. Um, I also put a lot of effort into class notes, which takes a long time. But I think that people often go to a class and it's great, but you can either have people really connecting to you in the class and paying attention, or you can have them writing notes. And I'd rather have people really listening to me and really engaging in what we're doing, which means I need to write the notes and I need to have those available so that people then have the references, the examples, the, the designs, the whatever it is that, that we want. And I think through the sequence of what I'm, what I'm working on. I don't read through my notes when I'm teaching. I have a series of dot points that remind me what I'm wanting to hit in what order. Um, and if I'm doing it online, I'll have time codes so that I know what marks I need to hit to get through the material. Smart. So you've reigned as Baroness and then Princess twice. Yes. Um, 
obviously your first time as Baroness would have been quite a learning experience and you would have had to come up with a whole bunch of different different ways of doing court and, and what it actually means to be in that role. Um, so what are, the, what are some of the things that you came up with during that time that um, you're proud of as, as part of that development of Rowany? That's a really interesting question. Um, yes, we, I mean, we were all making it up. So I had to make up what happened in court. And um, because I was Baroness by myself, I, I, I was the 10 years that I did the job, it was just, it was just me. Um, that meant that I had a great deal of artistic freedom in how I managed that. Uh, but in fact, what it meant was that I developed some standard patterns. And in fact, there, there are at, in the early days, there were people who could take me off really well. They knew exactly like the phrases that I would use and the gestures that I would use. But standing in front of a group of people or sitting usually in front of a group of people and doing the court thing was fabulous training for all kinds of things. It meant that I had no public fear. I could speak extemporaneously in front of an audience with no problems at all because, you know, in my early 20s, I had a lot of practice. At it. And that was, that, that was so useful. I'm going to bring up a photo uh, of when you were Baroness. Can everyone see that? Is that, that's your first? Not, not yet. Not yes. Yet. No. <laughs> not, that, not that one? No, no photo. No photo. All right, no. hang on. One moment. Here we go. There it is. Yes. Yes. So that's um, you solo baronessing. It looks like you're handing out an award or something. No, I'm being. That was at our first ever twelfth night, which was in uh, January nineteen eighty two. So before, um, uh, is that right? Yes. So we were we were uh, new in the we were new in the society, and that's me standing up because I've just been given something. There's a bolt of cloth on the floor that you see you can see yep. that was that was a gift from a number of people in the barony. Oh, that's lovely. Do you know what you, you used that fabric for? <laughs> um, in the end, many, many years later, as in just in the last couple of years, I gave it away to somebody else because even though it was completely gorgeous, it was completely fantasy, but it was ideal for a superb dragon costume. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Oh my gosh, your sewing skills have always produced gorgeous works though. You look amazing there. I've never seen you with your hair out as well. So that's very exciting. <laughs> yes, before I had it cut short. Well, um, while I've got the photos up, oh, we'll jump to the next one. So this one is your first reign as princess. Yes, this was my first reign with Elfin. So I was, of course, still Baroness at the time, and I, and we got a, a I, I needed to have a vicar in to look after the, the barony while I was being princess. And the other thing is that, of course, at the same time as this, I was also Lockhart Seneschal. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and I was producing the newsletter. So it was a busy, it was a busy time. Um, so, yes, this, this was stepping up. This was stepping up with, with Elfin. Um, in 1991. Wow. A, a little bit different to, to Baroness. There have been a few um, reigns before. Oh, sorry. No, 1990. January 1990. That's when that was. So there have been, been a few PNP reigns before your first one. Is that yes. right? Yes. So how, how is it different stepping into kind of an established role um, compared to when you were doing the Baroness? Is it to take a load off, but like you're doing a thousand different things as well, so maybe not. I I found because of my long experience by this stage of being Baroness, I found it very easy to be princess. 
it was very easy to sit in the chair. It was very easy to talk to people. One of the things I'd learned as Baroness, which is still my first point of um, advice to new kings and queens stepping up, is how important court is for the people who are there. But it's only important and it's only interesting if they can actually hear you. So my advice is always look at the person in front of you and speak to the back of the room. You're, if, you, if you look at the person in front of you and speak to them, nobody can hear what you're saying and it's very boring. You need to speak to the back of the room but keep the intimacy by looking at the person. So that kind of thing I already had heaps of practice at. Um, and hang on a sec. <laughs> I think um, before our first rain, right. uh, we went around to Edward and Yolan's house to, to practice speaking loudly. <laughs> and I remember like being put through my paces to, <laughs> to learn how to actually address a room. And it helped a lot, honestly, that kind of that fake court practice was um, something that, that really kind of got us ready for our first appearances, <laughs> which was very handy because we were we were pretty useless at that point. I think the thing that was different, of course, was being with somebody else. And um, Elfin lived in a different uh, um, city to to me. He lived up in Newcastle. I lived in Sydney, so we were we were several hours drive apart. But it worked out really well. We had a lot of discussions beforehand when he was when he asked me could he fight for me. We had a lot of discussions, so we knew what we wanted to do. And we knew how we would break up what we were doing, and um, yeah, and and that worked that worked well. And it was nice having somebody else to talk to and somebody else to throw ideas around with. Mm. Someone to help make the hard choices, hard decisions. Mm. Yeah. I'll bring up the the other photo. Oh, I can. Here we go. Another amazing dress. <laughs> well, I didn't make this one. This was really, this was astonishing because um, th this was uh, Marguerite uh, and Gabrielle deciding that really um, they should make me a dress. And that's because this rain was a very different story in multiple different ways. But the previous one was something that I had, I had looked forward to this time Elfin had asked me, could he fight for me again? And I said, well, you know, there's a lot of things happening. I'm not sure that I really have the time. And, but he was really, really keen. And he said, look, I, I'm not going to win. It'll be fine. I couldn't go to the event. I, I couldn't go to the, the Crown Tawny. Um, and uh, I spoke to him the night before and he said, look, I've just hurt my foot and I'm not feeling really well. And I said, well, you know, don't fight. He said, no, no, it'll be fine. I, I'll, yeah. but I'm just warning you that I'm not going to do very well. And I said, that's fine. I, I, I really don't have the bandwidth to, to be princess right now. So of course, oh, and he stayed up drinking the entire night before at some other night's vigil. So of course he won. <laughs> and I was so pissed off with him. I think um, there's certainly a lot of stories of the, the fighter promising that they're under the weather and they're injured and they're not going to do well and then going on to win. Yeah. I think, I think half the reins have um, <laughs> been that way. I mean, it almost makes sense. I've heard a lot of uh, stories about people being sick or hung over. And of course, you don't want to get hit in the head. So you fight really well. Or you <laughs> There was also a difficult rain because we were in the middle of trying the, the three, uh, three rains a year system. Um, I'd handed over as Seneschal by this stage, so I wasn't Seneschal, thank goodness. But I'd, I'd, um, we had been doing two rains a year from right back from when we were doing the, the um, vice regal tourneys. And there was a push to make it three rains a year to line up with the West Kingdom so that our reins would align with theirs. I, there were lots of arguments for and against. So in the end, the decision by the then Seneschal was that we would give it a try for a year, three reins. 
So this second time was was three rounds. So it it was not a good system because what it meant was that you only had a third of the year instead of half the year. By this stage, we had more than 20 groups. You were still expected to try and hit as many of those as you could in the time. The other big thing that was difficult about it was that you never got to reign in your own right, by which I mean you stepped up and then the next day was the tournament for your successes. So there was never a period where you didn't have somebody behind you. Mm. You, never, you never had sole uh, ownership of that space. There, there was always somebody in the wings. And that caused its own problems, particularly if people were not happy with the views of the current crown, they would immediately go to the previous one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to, the, to the, you know, one that would be coming on. So that was problem number one. The next problem was... Rowany Festival, not normally a problem, but Elfin wasn't there. So that meant that in addition to everything else, I, I was going to do Rowany Festival by myself. And being in the Knights meeting was not great because I was a Laurel, I was a Pelican, I was fine with those, but they trying to get the knights, I knew that getting the knights to accept me as the princess and in charge of the meeting when they were all blokes and they were all knights and I wasn't, was going to be a, a tough ask. Um, so I was not looking forward to that. And I achieved what I needed to do, but it was not fun. So I did. I did not. Enjoy, I did not enjoy that. So that's one of the reasons that they made me the dress was they thought, okay, all all of these things are going to be really bad. We'll we'll make you a frock. That'll. Be it. So it's the only piece of garb I've ever had in my entire SCA life that somebody else made. Oh my god, that's amazing. And it was a lovely thing for them to do. Absolutely. I think um, I think there's probably a little bit of fear in in making you stuff all your stuff is so beautiful and so well made that I feel like if someone <laughs> made something they'd just feel like it wasn't good enough <laughs> so I wanted to ask because obviously you've been there for everything are there any older lock-up traditions that you particularly liked that maybe fell out of fashion or that we don't observe currently Traditions, I think we've managed to keep a, a lot of our traditions. It's, Lockhart develops, uh, every kingdom develops its, its own flavour over time. And because we were isolated, we developed a really distinctive flavour very early on. In the early days, we were, we were really lucky. Once we made contact with, with the society, we had some visitors from the USA and they came, three or four of them, uh, William the Lucky, Mistress Hillary of Serendip and some others, but those were the two key people, came pretty much every year for about four or five years, which was just astonishing given how little free time they had and how, how they were using some of their very limited time to come and see us. And each year they brought a flay that they brought, uh, they had an influx of ideas and information and skills and so on. But they also had a perspective on us because they saw us once a year and they commented on things that we did well, better, differently, as well as things that we didn't do as well. And one of the things that was a bit sad very early on was that because we'd started from looking at a medieval perspective rather than the SCA thing, in the very early years, everybody wore headwear because that was what you see in the, in the illustrations. That's what you see in the paintings and the miniatures and so on. When we had these very influential American people coming in, they didn't. So after that, people stopped. 
So there were negative impacts as well as the positive impacts. So they commented on the fact that from fairly early on, we had a um, we did a lot of costuming because that was something that I did. And we also had other people who took that up too. And we did a lot of dance and we did a lot of music. Again, those were things that were things that I enjoyed and became very much part of what we did and food. So again, because of the medieval thing, we were all of our food right from the beginning was trying to be medieval. Now in the first while we didn't have very good resources, but we had some and we, we never did any, we, we never tried to do anything other than making medieval food. Um, so that was, that was something that was part of what we did from very early on. And likewise, the scribal thing, that was something that I got into and a, and a group of friends, some of whom were very talented. And we, we became known um, for having incredibly high levels of scribal art, again, very early on. And that became part of, uh, part of the flavour of what Lockhart was. We had crap armour <laughs> because we really didn't have, we, we had a couple of people who were uh, munitions armourers. Um, Baron Brucey got his pelican for armouring. Um, so, <laughs> which gives you some idea. Of, you know, he, he, um, never, never mind the the quality, feel the width. It was like, we just need to get people into armour and he did a huge amount of it. So there were things that, and that took us, that was something that I was never, I never did. It was something that I would have loved other people to do, but it wasn't something that I could do myself or teach. Um, and it took us a long time to get the, the armour standards up. Mm. But back to your question about traditions. I think that one of the things that, used to be the case which is no longer the case that I miss but I understand why it doesn't exist anymore is we no longer people no longer try and be in the moment people don't use forsooth speech they don't try and set the event aside from the everyday world and try not to talk about the modern world and try not to refer to things and so on we used to do that very consciously we used to deliberately say at the beginning of the event you know leave the mundane world behind and and when everybody in the room is trying to make that happen it can be a, a fabulous magical experience i understand why people don't do that now it's very hard to disconnect from this world people are constantly on their phones even at events like it's the modern world has intruded so while some things have gotten better and better we now have beautiful armour and the standard of costuming in Lockhart is gorgeous and more and more people are making more and more stuff. We have so much access to so many fabulous resources, particularly online resources are just astonishing that our stuff is better and better and better, but the feel is not there. Um, and yeah, sometimes I miss that. I, I think that's probably something that could change though like it's I think there's probably a lot of people that would want to to give it a go but don't necessarily think it's it's something that they should be doing they're just kind of going with the flow but I don't, I don't think there's probably space to say all right I'm gonna this event's got this theme and I want everyone to just get right into it um, I think with that kind of encouragement it could certainly bring some of that magic back I think that would be fun, but I think you're right. I and I think you would need to um, set people's expectations before the event that this was how we were going to play it uh, and remind people at the beginning of the event that this is, this, we got, we're going to give this a try. I, th I think it would be, I think it would be fun. You might, you might find it funny to know, at least on some level when it comes to the headgear conversation, uh, when Felix won his first crown, we had just come back from the West Kingdom and I saw all of the beautiful Western queens with their hair down and the princesses with their hair down. And I went, I'm going to do that. So at the victory feast, I wore my hair down. And the first thing that someone said to me, giving me advice was, hey, next time, pack a veil. <laughs> <laughs> so that tradition does still live on. <laughs> After after our first rain, we got a, a few few compliments about the fact that I had headwear throughout the whole rain. Um, I've kind of 
gone a bit earlier and earlier over the years so it, it's less of a less of a thing but so yeah the headwear thing is still very much out there you always looked amazing <laughs> But now that that's come around, now um, more and more people wear headwear and wear really good, appropriate, you know, stuff that really makes their outfit work. And it's it's definitely a situation that new people coming into the group, they see the standard in the group, they see the level, and that's what they copy. And we did that um, uh, with all kinds of things. If you don't tell somebody that something's hard, then they just accept that that's the standard and they just do it. Um. I have to admit, getting ready for today, I'm like, okay, I need to put something on my head, but I don't have anything and everything's packed away and I don't have time to make a, a garland. Oh. So yeah, it was right on top of my mind, but not actually on my head. Um, so you, your uh, kind of interests are very, in the later period com compared to, I guess, where my interests lie. What, what are some of the, um, the styles or the themes or even activities that you're not particularly interested in participating in, but you love to see around? Oh, because um, my interest is definitely in trying to recreate how people lived and through that to understand a lot more about it. So when we go to festival, as you know, my my household, we we don't have any refrigeration. We, we, we really do it, you know, we, we do all the food and we do all the cooking and um, I love what I've learned out of that. And I love seeing people do that in other examples. So there are some great uh, Norse groups, subgroups in the kingdom who are putting a huge amount of effort into living history and to understanding and trying to live in the in the time and use the, the fabrics and cook the food and use the methods and so on. So it's not my particular culture interest, but it is absolutely a passion in terms of what they're doing and how they're doing it. And I think that's fabulous. I, so I, I love seeing that. Mm. Some cool stuff coming out for sure. Mm. I wanted to ask a question about longevity and staying engaged. So you are active in, in so many ways because you're involved with the worship, bleh, Worshipful Company of Broiderers. You're getting back into the scribal arts. And from my experience, you're, you're, you never do anything by half measures. And obviously you've been doing that forever. So what advice would you give to other peers on staying engaged and staying inspired within the SCA? It is a long time. And um, in, in fact, before <laughs> this morning, my husband asked me the same question. He said, I think that that's one of the really interesting things is how you've, you've managed to stay engaged for so long. And I think that the answer is partly what I spoke of earlier, which is from a crafting point of view and from a general engagement point of view, I have had a whole sequence of different things that I've done. So for a while, I was heavily involved in scribes. In fact, I was provost of scribes twice. So that was very much my focus at the time. And then after doing that for a chunk of time, I set that aside and then I've been doing embroidery as a focus for a really long time. So, um, and there will come a point in the probably not too distant future where I need to step down as master. I've been master of the company for a long time. And I think somebody else needs to step up and do that. So I think it's important to recognize that it's okay for things to have a natural rhythm. You don't have to stay engaged doing the same thing, interested in the same thing forever. That the, the society is broad enough that you can uh, get enthused about a thing you can uh, pay, perhaps push a particular agenda you can do whatever and then that it's okay to step down step aside to put that aside and to and to take up something else I think that 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 people burn out when the effort that they're putting in exceeds their enjoyment if they're doing it just because just because they feel that they have to, or people are relying on them, or they've always done this, so they need to keep doing it forever. 
I, I think that that way lies burnout. I can stay interested in doing things because I continue to follow my interests. I think the second thing, the second important thing is teaching. That I teach a huge amount and I love teaching. And that also brings renewal. When you teach people, you are enthusiastic to them and you get their enthusiasm back. And I love people coming to me later on and saying, uh, I went to your class on this and look, I made this thing. Um, and that's a, that's a fabulous feed into um, feeling worthwhile and, and that what your effort is, uh, the effort that you're putting out is, is bringing back, is, is being rewarded. I think there are responsibilities and um, because I have been involved in a lot of things for a lot of time, I have a lot of ongoing responsibilities within the society. And it's always a balance about how to manage those. Um, and again, if, if the responsibility means, if the thing that you're doing is, is sucking the life out of the things that you enjoy, then you need to rethink that. It's possible still to be engaged, just find another way to do it. I'm always really sad when somebody pushes themselves or wears themselves out past their elastic limit and then chucks everything in and says, well, I'm, I'm sick of this. I, it's no fun anymore. I hate everything. And they, and they storm off or they, they curl up into a corner or whatever. And they throw away everything. Much better to see that my enjoyment in this is tailing off. Let's, let's manage that uh, and, and accept that that's, that's happening and that that's okay. And, and let that go, find some other, find some other path. But, mm -hmm. but teaching is fun. And teaching often means that I'll explore something new too. So uh, people will ask me to teach on a particular topic. And it may not be something I know a huge amount about, but adjacent to something that I know about. So that'll give me another new rabbit hole to go and explore. <laughs> and setting myself challenges. Um, one of the things I did a few years ago now was that I came up with the idea for festival. I like giving a prize for the fighter auction 20. And I thought, oh, I'll make a hat. I'll make a hat to suit a particular person. So I put in an IOU for a hat. And that turned out to be a fun thing. So I've been doing that for quite a few years now, a hat prize at festival and a hat prize at Canterbury Fair. And that means that I'm making two hats a year that are completely random and completely determined by what the person wants. So I've made uh, ancient Greek hats and I've made 15th century French hats and I've made uh, you know, uh, Norse 1000 hats and I, you know, and that's, that's been fun. I've, I've enjoyed that. So yeah. <laughs> so there are lots of ways to stay engaged but you have to be realistic about how much time and energy and so on you've got. Mm -hmm. And you can't do everything all of the time. And that applies to life too. I look um, in the preparation for this website stuff, I've been listing out all the, all the projects to write up. There are a lot. But it was interesting to notice that there was one particular year when I did very few projects. And that's because um, my husband and I were rebuilding our house. And that took pretty much all, we were doing 20 hours a week on it. And that took pretty much all the time and all the effort and so on. And that's okay too. Absolutely. Would, would you want to rain as queen? I've been asked that a couple of times. I'm not sure. I, I kind of feel I'd love to rain if I could rain with my husband, but, um, He's not a fighter, as you probably spotted. He he would make a fabulous king in terms of uh, administrating and enthusing and doing all those things. I mean, he's a great kingdom seneschal. So he would and and we would have lots of fun working on that together. But doing it with someone else, I think, 
I'm not sure. Um, maybe, I think it would depend on the person. I think it would depend on the circumstances. Yeah, you definitely have to have a partnership, for sure. We, I just wanted to touch on, we have about five more minutes. We can keep going if you're comfortable, if everyone has the time. So I figured I would check in. Do we need to turn off at one hour or would we like to continue a little bit longer? I can go a little bit longer until the, until the kid comes home. <laughs> we know it's when that'll be. Rowan, are you yeah. happy? Yeah, I can, I can go a little bit over. Okay. I wanted to ask, is there a favourite memory that you have from your time in the society? Oh, I have lots of favourite memories. Lots. You can uh, say if there's no... We're, we're keeping... <laughs> there's no artificial limit. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think... The first Twelfth Night that we had, where we'd only been going uh, a year or so, and we had 120 people at the event, and everybody had put so much effort into dressing up and dressing up the hall and so on. That was amazing. That, that was quite uh, a stunning thing. I think the first principality um, step up when we became a principality in our own right. That was really, uh, that was really important for me. And I remember looking down from the gallery on the sea of people below again, all in their, in their finest and looking magnificent and thinking, you know, I, if I fell under a bus now, this would absolutely keep going. And that was a really important thing that that I had put so much effort for so many years into getting this up and running and engaging other people in, in doing things. But I knew that if I disappeared, that everything would keep going, that, that there were uh, enough people with skills and enthusiasm and drive and interest and so on, that, it would, that, that we, were, we were secure, we were, we were mature or maturing The first after becoming a kingdom was pretty big. That was uh, quite an astonishing thing. And for me, kind of the flowering of all of the work that I'd put in. And there was the, the astonishing moment where we, we said goodbye to the West Kingdom. So where we handed back our crowns, we handed back our fealty, um, as, as peers, and we had this really interesting, weird time, an interregnum of an hour or so, where we weren't part of the West Kingdom anymore, but we weren't our own kingdom yet either. Our new king and queen hadn't stepped up. So we, were, we had this kind of limbo time. And I remember talking to some of the other peers walking around and we all felt really odd, it was really strange. And I think that that time, having that actual gap meant that when our new king and queen were invested and we gave our new fealty to our new kingdom, it made it more, uh, more joyful, more powerful because we'd had that break in between. The other moment that really stands in, in my mind sharp was the next day when we made our first laurel, uh, as the Kingdom of Lockhart. Um, and I remember being on my knees in the grass in the court and it was Cluellen. And I had sit and, and saying the words of the oath over in my head as the Herald read them aloud. And I knew those words so well. I mean, I've been in so many peerage ceremonies. And then when we got to Kingdom of the West, they said Kingdom of Lock Ark. And that was amazing. It's incredible. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing how 
a hobby can have that much emotional impact on you, right? I, I can't imagine any other kind of hobby or sport or craft where it is such a deep connection to the things that you're doing and the people around you. It's what what we have here and, and a lot of that is thanks to you is like out of this world, right? <laughs> but nothing else. So thanks. <laughs> Um, on a, a slight different kind of track, there's been a, obviously a lot of change over the time um, that you've been playing. Is there a change that's yet to come that you would love to see happen? That's an interesting question. I, <laughs> I don't know that I've looked into the future in the last few years with any intent. I guess in the past I had goals for the group. So uh, to become a principality, to become a kingdom. And then once we'd achieved that, I guess to take our part with the other kingdoms in the world. And we've done all of those things. So I, I haven't really had uh, an agenda. I suppose my because my own personal bent is interest in research and uh, authenticity and the fun that comes from trying to make something real and do something real and, and um, what, what you learn about people, uh, how, how amazingly inventive people always have and how quite often the medieval solution works really well, those sorts of things. That is a trend that is already happening. And I think one of the interesting things that's happening at the moment is because, in part because of what's happened with uh, COVID and the isolation that that's forced on us, which has brought us into new ways of connecting, that this, I mean, the, the fact that we're talking here online from multiple different places are all around the world. Um, and now this is part of how we do things. And uh, this, this is, I think, part of how we will do things in the future. And that's, again, like anything good and bad, you know, you spread the bad things as well as spreading the good things. But I think that it's wonderful to be able to connect with other people. And I think that that's brought um, new ways of, of joining people up with other people who are interested in the same things and access to resources. So I don't know that I've, I've got any personal agenda for, for what will happen. I see, I think the connectivity is good. I think that that will last even once eventually this plague passes and we can move freely again. I think that there will be a new interconnectivity and that that will persist and that we will continue to do things in new ways. But I don't, I don't need to have a personal agenda. I have things that I would like to do, but I, I would like the kingdom to remain healthy and happy. I can do that at, at the local level. I, I spend time at the local level, making sure that the local group is healthy and happy. I've had local offices for, for a while. I've just been hospitaler for the last two years, focusing on, on bringing newcomers into the group. And that's, you know, that's so different to working at the, at the grand scale. Um, I think you always, once, once you reign, and I'm sure that you both know that, once you reign, you never see things again in the same way. You will always have a view out and an eye out and think from the perspective of the broader whole. You can't help but think from a kingdom perspective. Um, and I know that that's a change that a lot of people find in themselves. Also, if you if you act as kingdom seneschal, you you never see things in the same way because you know what goes into making everything work on the surface. So you always are aware of of all of that work that's going in by so many people to keep this all working. It doesn't really answer your question. So I wanted to backtrack a little bit to another sort of historical question, but for, for those outside of Lockhart or those who might not know, our Kingdom Courtesy Award is named after you. 
so was that something that you were aware of before it was announced? And how did that make you feel? I mean, there's not a lot of opportunities usually to really appreciate someone uh, with, within their lifetime in that way, which is quite incredible. So I didn't know about it. No, it was a surprise. Um, and uh, I thought it was uh, it was a very unexpected thing. So I was the first recipient of the award that bears my name. Um, and it, yes, it, it, it was a surprise and they had um, gone to quite a lot of trouble to make a token for it and, and all of the other things. So that, that, was, that was a wonderful thing. I, I do feel very well acknowledged for the, the effort that I've put in over the years. I have a barony named after me. I have an award named after me. Um, I have all, all kinds of awards. And so I, it, it was a very precious thing. And I, I do find that every time I'm there when somebody gets one, it, it's kind of a personal thing as well. I always try and go up and, and talk to the person. Um, I always think it's such a lovely thing. So yeah, it's a very special award. For me. I, I love seeing it given out. That's so sweet. it on as a responsibility as well. That's lovely. I, I, I noticed in, in the past rain um, when we've been looking at um, the recommendations and your in, like emotional and personal investment in the the people that are, are bringing that grace and courtesy and um, like you can see your face when the award's given out you're just so happy and like it, it's, it's so lovely to see that connection back to to what we're recognizing people for it's um yeah it's beautiful speaking of your awards I was having a look in canon and your first award was the pelican um, and then you've got a whole stack of others and then you got an AOA almost 20 years later. <laughs> oh, that yes, was that, was a, <laughs> that was a story. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, that happened at our, when we became a kingdom. So that was at our first kingdom, at, at our first crown elevation. And I was standing at the back of the hall where somebody was getting an award of arms. I can't remember who. And the person next to me said, I can't believe that they, they don't have an award of arms. Radnor, that's who it was. And I said, well, I don't have an award of arms. And he disappeared. And five minutes later, I was called up in court to get my award of arms. <laughs> Which everybody thought was very funny. I was, I was actually quite annoyed with him because I quite enjoyed the fact that I didn't have an award of arms. It was, it, was it was a point of difference. That my first <laughs> award was a pelican and I never got an award of arms. Oh, happened now. <laughs> so we do have a question that's come through. Obviously, there's been quite a lot of development over the years uh, with the SEA in terms of non-European personas being... Uh, more broadly accepted and accepted by the society as an organization. So what are your thoughts and feelings on the broadening of the SEA scopes and uh, some of the pushback that people feel from sort of encompassing the non-European persona aspects? We, again, in Lockhart, so this is speaking just locally, right from the very beginning, we actually had some um, non-European people interested in non-European areas and so we had some people who had non-European persona right right from the beginning so we had a couple of people who were uh, interested in Arabic and very early on we had a couple of people who were interested in Mongolian so that was actually part of our normality right right from really early on for me I've always seen it as being uh, the, the core of what we were doing was, was European, but Europe touched so many other countries. I mean, the, there was huge trading that was going on and 
I mean, we know much more about that now and we're, we're aware now of the astonishing depth that that, that, was, that that was going on. But, which is why I keep posting periodically, you'll see it in Lockhart where I post another thing, which is, you know, here's how the world was interconnected in more ways than you realize. So for me, I have never had any problem with, um, with expanding the borders geographically out because the, the, the world of the Middle Ages was, was bigger than Europe. I mean, yes. They, there, were, there were crusades. Those crusades went somewhere. There, there, were, <laughs> there was trafficking um, uh, silks along the Silk Road and spices and all of that was, was part of the medieval world. So for me personally, I, I have always seen that as being part of the medieval world. And I have always been able to, if you were trying to imagine a, a court that it was known. We have, we have paintings, we have illuminations and so on that show people from other cultures coming to the courts. So, so even then it, uh, it has never felt too anachronistic for me to see that because that was, that was part of the reality. The thing that I have a harder time with, um, and that's because of the context in which um, I joined the society, is the dates. So when I started, it was 600 to 1600. And it, the argument that was given at the time was that, that the, the culture changed so much. So after the fall of the Roman Empire was really when Europe started to, to get its own flavor rather than just being part of the Roman Empire, which was did its damnedest to try and make everything as uniform as possible. So much more efficient that way. But after that, the, the individual cultures started to develop their own identity a lot more. So I could see that that was logical. And certainly after the death of Elizabeth, we're really into a very different territory. When things have started to move earlier, I, that that I find harder because it's not the medieval mindset is is a particular thing, and I think that the the ancient times have a have a different mindset. They have a different worldview. It's an equally valid one, and I have no problems with people who want to um, research and uh, recreate and and do the whole living history thing in in those time periods. That, seems to me utterly valid. Um, I just, I have trouble understanding that as, as medieval. I understand. Yes. On a related note, I always wanted to ask, because I, I know that you make your garb and uh, try to keep within a 100, is it 10 year, sorry, 10 year period, which is amazing. So what has kept you playing in the SCA rather than other uh, maybe more strict living history groups that are now available? Um, geography, I suspect. I, I think that if I lived, I think that if I lived in uh, England or I lived in Europe, I would, I, I would be playing with those very strict groups. Um, although uh, that would mean making a new wardrobe because I'm not aware of any you know, 1520s groups, uh, German uh, groups. And I think that I would enjoy that. I think that I would enjoy that being in a culture that was trying to recreate a specific time and place. But that's not something I can do here. It's not something that I can. And even if, even if I did do that, I and I was living overseas, I think that I would still stay, still be playing with the SCA as well, because it, it's a different thing. The advantage of a particular time and place is that you really do get to try and recreate life in that time but I love the amazing variety that we have and all the things that that different people bring and their different passions and I enjoy talking to somebody who's completely passionate about their uh, Norse nail bending um, and somebody who's interested in their uh, Ah, you know, something quite at the opposite end of the sale, which completely escapes me right at this minute. So I, I love that too. So I think that I think that if I lived somewhere where that was available, I would do that. But I wouldn't do that by forsaking the SCA. I would do that as well. 
What are some um, tips for newcomers or, or people who just haven't put a lot of kind of um, focus on doing authentic or period uh, specific recreation? What are some tips to help people make their, their look or their kits feel and look a bit more period? Ah, that's a big question. And I guess it depends on the person. So one of the things that I always try and do is to find out what somebody's interested in. And I think one of the other strengths of the, the society is the fact that we don't require everybody to do everything. And we don't require everybody to do everything well. So if somebody's main interest is in fighting or cooking or something, and really their clothes are about making them fit in they they don't actually care about the clothes then you shouldn't make them try and care about the clothes what's important is to help them get to a point where they are they look comfortable they look right they feel comfortable and what they're wearing is practical for the activities that they really do want to be doing so I think that when I talk to newcomers I, I try and find out what they're interested in and if they if costume if garb clothes is what they're interested in I'm really happy to talk to them but but they I think the advice that I give them is usually you don't have to make you don't have to have everything right we have a lot of stuff that we can lend you we can lend you things to give you enough time to figure out what you'd like to make what what time period really attracts you what country really attracts you don't don't spend all your effort right at the beginning this is a long this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. You don't, don't try and do everything at the front, figure out what you want to do and let us ease you into that and, and make life easier for you as you go. But in terms of things, quick, quick changes to make uh, your garb look more real. Um, headwear, have I mentioned headwear? It, it's probably the single thing that makes the biggest difference between wearing a frock and wearing a whole outfit because we don't wear headwear. It looks so different. Uh, it also feels really different. Um, and a lot of people don't find it very comfortable to wear because we don't wear hats generally. But that is probably the single biggest thing. I think the next biggest thing would be length that, um, that the, the dresses, if you're female, uh, go to the ground. They don't go to like mid calf and that's, a change. Um, don't wear massively thick belts, very SCA, not very medieval. Everybody loves it. <laughs> <laughs> don't put braid on everything. That would be the only <laughs> Trim, it's a very SCA thing. It's also very um, Anglo Saxon, even Norman. But as soon as you get out of the 12th century, everything's plain as. I guess everyone kind of starts with the the basic tea tunic which is a very kind of anglo-saxon style and the trim and the the big keyhole necklines and yep. <laughs> you gotta start and it's an easy thing to start with and it, it's nice to to be able to personalize it as well I guess yeah and for some people that remains what they're interested in and that's great the headgear conversation is always really funny because at least from, from what histories I've listened to and read, it's a very like second half of the 20th century thing to no longer need to wear hats because first half of the 20th century back, men were expected to wear hats when they left the house. Mm. You know, there's so many cultural mm. implications for European women to wear veils um, depending on their, their status or age. So, you know, it's it makes sense that one way to make your kit look more realistic is to cover cover that head how how do you stop veils from just falling off i can't do it ah it's it's all in the it's all in the underpinnings so it depends what time period you're talking about but for quite a range um if you use uh, a a brigitte cap that that fits on your head the veil goes on it pins into that it doesn't fall off it's really easy and slightly before that um a barbette, which is just a, a strip of cloth, which goes on, pins on the top, and then you pin the veil onto that 
you can't keep them on with a circlet, they'll just fall off. I could never get the pins even when I, when I was <laughs> doing it, wonky. <laughs> then you try to put the crown on the pins and you're like, oh. <laughs> so I suppose we're just about to come up on the hour and a half mark. So, oh my um, goodness. I know, I know. It's been amazing having you. And uh, I just wanted to note that you're a very big personal inspiration for me. And I know a lot of people around the kingdom. So thank you for, for being so engaged. Um, I always, one of the things I always harp on about you in particular is uh, remembering times where I'd be, you know, in Laurel's prize and, and Felix and I would be sitting next to each other and and people go, oh, that's pretty, but not necessarily engage on the same level. You always have something insightful to say to people about their projects, no matter what the topic. And I've always been impressed by your range of knowledge, but also your courtesy and care and actually engaging with people in their projects with the knowledge that you have. So thank you. Thank um, you. Was there anything that you haven't covered that you would love to talk about before we say goodbye? I think we've covered a huge amount of stuff. Um, I guess the only question would be, are there any questions in the chat that we haven't answered? Well, not currently. We'll, we can give them a minute to see if anyone wants to throw something out. Um, in, the, in the meantime, while we wait for a couple of questions, is there a favorite story that you can share with us? Or any story, something fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can remember, yes, here's, here's, here's a one that I enjoy thinking about. Back to the early days, very early days. In fact, uh, I think the first, possibly the second time at Rowney Festival that William Delucky and some of the other Americans had, had come across. And we were sitting in the tavern, which is the tavern that we built. And there were a group of people around and he was telling war stories. War stories are such a great way of enculturing people. And he was talking about the early days of the SCA and he was talking about um, the, very, the very early days because he was in from quite early. And talking to the people then and they were sitting around and saying, you know, if this really catches on one day, we might have 20 fighters. And I thought, you know, if this really catches on, one day we might have 20 fighters. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Which is amazing, because I'm always a little bit sad when we get like less than 10 people at a training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. Oh. Oh, okay. I, I, I'll tell you one other, again, very early story, which you probably know, but it's a good one, which is a, on our first camping event, um, before it was Rowany Festival, so the year before it became Rowany Festival, and we were camped in what then became the parking lot of the first place that we had festival. We had the, I talked about the two barrel helms, the amazing two barrel helms. So many people wasted so much film on taking pictures of those two barrel homes. Um, and we had armor. And so what would happen was that the tournaments were run by the two people with the barrel helms had a fight and then they would take the helmets off and then the next two people would put on those helmets and then they would fight. You can imagine how well this worked. Gosh. <laughs> we were not, <laughs> the fighting was That's not awesome. at any level. I think there was no danger actually. But I, I was thinking, this is all well and good, but everybody's only fighting one-on-one. -on -one. Nobody gets to like fight in a group. What we really need is a way of fighting in a group. So I came up with the idea. I went into my, um, my tent and I got out my wooden chest with the rope handles. And I thought, what we need is some group combat scenario. So I went down to the creek and I filled it full of rocks enough so that I couldn't lift it by myself. Um, and then I called everybody together and I said, what we're going to do is to have a group combat. So we're going to have two teams and the two people with the helmets are the two team captains and they get to pick sides until we run out of motorbike helmets. 
And then we had more people who still wanted to play. So I said, okay, you, we can have two people extra per side and they're not in armor and they are the box bearers and they're allowed to pick up the box and run with it, but they're not allowed to be hit. And so we had the first little rock war, which was over the box of rocks, which was my, my tawny chest full of rocks. And um, they had so much fun that it became an every year thing. But of course, every year we got bigger and bigger and bigger. And we maintained, God help, oh, and um, we maintained the un, unarmored box bearers for quite a lot of years until we got to the point that we had like 50 people on the field, at which point it was deemed that probably we need to stop doing this now. Oh, that's nice. I awesome. still have the box. <laughs> you still have the rocks. And I, I still have one of the little rocks, um, which I did as a figurine. I have, I have the, the two, I painted up the figurines of the two um, original captains and, and, and put a little rock. In the oh, that's adorable. Where there's a will, there's a way, right? Right. <laughs> okay. So we haven't had any more questions. Well, we should wrap it up then. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for, for joining us. And um, it's been it's been a real, really interesting hearing some of your personal stories and a bit more of the history and your perspectives on things. So thank you so much. And thank you, Eva, as well for, for co-hosting and to Magnus Our Tech in the background. Um, yeah, it's been it's been a very interesting hour and a half. <laughs> thank you for asking me. It's awesome. been a pleasure. So uh, there should be some more interview events coming up in the near future. I can't think of which is next off the top of my head, but uh, do like and follow Crown Between Two Roses to see all upcoming events. Thank you again, Your Excellency, and thank you, Your Grace, and thanks, Magnus, invisible in the background as always, <laughs> and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.